We are back on Morning Line. Thanks for joining us. Our guest with us this morning, Dr. Kim Sandler. She's a co-director of the Vanderbilt Lung Screening Pro Program. More and more hospitals uh, setting these up now, right? Yes, Vandy absolutely. Vandy has one. You consult with other hospitals getting going, but every hospital doesn't necessarily have one. I mean, how do you find out if you live, and we have people living in other counties, rural areas, where you just ask, do you have one, or do they have to come into the city to get it done? Sure, you can ask your primary care doctors, oh, yeah. and we're partnering with a lot of our other hospitals in our network to try and offer screening in other places. Screening is very uh, regulated, so okay. you have to have a scan done on a CT scanner that has been approved to perform screening, because we use such a low dose when we do these CT scans, the amount of radiation is very, very low, and that has to be regulated. You also want to make sure that you have somebody interpreting your scan who reads a significant number of chest CT scans. You know what they're saying. Yes. As you said, there can be false positives. Yes. All right, let's go to Perry. Hi, or Penny. Hi, Penny. Are you there, Penny? Hello. Hi, Penny. Go ahead. Hi, uh, yes. Um, I, I've been smoking um, for over 30 years now. Um, I have tried to quit smoking and everything. I was diagnosed with um, in 2003. And then... Um, for the last two years, I have had full-blown COVD, emphysema, asthma, I mean, the whole nine yards. And in the wintertime, it gets worse. And my mother and my, gra and my grandmother both died at 57 with lung cancer. And I'm 53. Um, I've never had the CT scan. Um, but I was wondering about how to go to get it because I know that I really need to get one so to make sure that I've got the COPD and everything yeah. to get the cancer. Does it sound like she would qualify? So she will qualify at age 55. At so age 55, you would qualify. Yes, and that's for insurance coverage. Now, if you talk to your doctor, they may decide that you should have a CT scan for another reason. But based on our current recommendations, at age 55, we know that your risk is high enough that the benefits of having a CT scan would outweigh the risks of things like false positives and, and other things that we could find. Um, we have a website, VanderbiltLungScreening.com, that has all of the information about screening that we perform. It also has information that you can look at for medical providers in terms of where they can have the scan done. Um, so I would definitely recommend that you look at that and talk to your doctor. They may decide that you should wait until 55. They may decide that there are other reasons to have a scan earlier. Yeah, but boy, Penny, you're on it. I, and I understand, gosh, if there's any way you can reduce your smoking, she says she's tried. And you, like you said, it's a brutal addiction to fight. And she knows she wants to, but she has two, two relatives, mother and I think sister, did she say? Um, that had lung cancer, mm -hmm. all right, and her age and everything else. I mean, you are on that path, and I don't. I'm not telling you something you don't know. You're on the path to lung cancer. It just you may may not get it, but she knows. Mm -hmm. You got to move on it, right. I guess. And I, I hate to think that maybe something started and she has to wait two years to get checked. You know, you don't want to give that cancer two years to grow. So get with your doctor and point it out and say, look, you watched Morning Line. There's a screening program. Maybe I should be screened for something and he mm -hmm. can or she can recommend it for mm -hmm. you. And what we really emphasize at Vanderbilt is that this is a screening program. So smoking cessation and helping our patients to quit smoking is one of the most important things that That's we can part do. Of it, then, the Absolutely. Treatment. There's smoking cessation counseling. We have what's called a shared decision making visit where a, a healthcare professional, usually a nurse practitioner, will meet with every patient before the scan is performed and talk about the risks and benefits and talk about smoking cessation for our patients who are still smoking. And we offer um, different aids for quitting smoking. We offer the Tennessee Quit Line and other materials that can help and we are there to help our patients to quit smoking. It's a really important part of our program. Yeah, you say you talk about risks and benefits. What's the risks? There's risk with radiation. So anytime you have a CT scan there is some radiation. <coughs> it's as I mentioned very very low. The f risk of finding something that could be cancer but then turns out to be a false positive and needing to have additional diagnostic tests, even a biopsy to determine that something's benign is probably the greatest risk with screening. That we would find something that could be cancer, and then we have to do additional testing to learn that it's then benign. Okay, and so there's just risk involved. I mean, uh, how, by the way, how much, if I wanted to pay cash for a CT scan, would it cost? It depends on where you go. So our CT scans are around $250. Mm -hmm. um, if you wanted to pay out of pocket, we can help with payment plans where patients often will pay a third up front and then can pay over time. And that's one of those when you go into a tube, right? A CT scan? 
Yes. Right? You go in a tube and this thing just kind of zzz, 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 it doesn't hurt or anything. I've had yeah. one. There's and no pain. It's less than 10 seconds. Okay. And that's actually, now PET scans are more expensive, right? PET scans are more expensive. So as you sort of go up in the technology, it becomes more and more yeah. expensive. MRIs are even more expensive. What's interesting with PET scans is that we actually will give a radio labeled tracer in the blood that then can detect metabolic activity. So sometimes if a patient has an abnormality on a CT scan and we're trying to decide if it's cancer or maybe it's something like a scar, that patient will then go on to have a PET CT. I swear I was given something orally before my CT scan that would allow them to maybe see stuff. Yes. Is that yeah, so particularly if you were having a CT scan of the belly, of the yeah. abdomen and pelvis yeah. maybe, rather than of That's the chest, That's what I had. there is contrast that then can go into the small and large bowel, and it can help to distend that and make it more, um, it's easier for our radiologists to see abnormalities. Interesting. Okay, let's go next to Emma. I think Emma. Hi, Emma, go ahead. Yeah, uh, my question is, I'm, I was a smoker, but I'm I'm quit. I'm using the Nicolette gum. I was wondering if it was okay to use that. I could see all PD. Did, yeah. uh, did you catch what she yeah, said? Yeah, so Emma, you, you, firstly, you. congratulations on quitting smoking. That's wonderful. The lung screening is still available to patients who quit up to 15 years ago. So if you have smoked within the past 15 years and you meet the age and pack year guidelines of being age 55 to 77 and having that 30 pack year history, if you have smoked within the past 15 years, then you are still eligible for screening based on our current guidelines. Oh, okay, then. Thank you. Hey, thank, thank you, you, Emma. And you keep chewing that gum. Good, good for her. Good for her. Let's go next to Joe. Joe, good morning, buddy. Hello, Joe. Oh, Joe was on hold for a while. We may have just lost him. I hate it. He'll call back. He always does. Joe, are you there? I think I hit Joe on three, right? Okay. Well, we'll come back to him. If you want to check, he may have put us on hold because he had been on for a little bit of uh, time there. I'm sorry? Hey, Monty. Good morning, Monty. Good morning. Hey, what's on your mind? Oh, I got a question and a comment. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm 65 years old and I've never smoked. I hate smoking. I hate the smell of it. But yes. I've lived with second in secondhand smoke for a lot of years. And my question is, uh, uh, cigarette smoking didn't buy them anywhere. And and what's what's the dangers of that? versus uh, marijuana smoking, and I have smoked marijuana, and I would today if I had some, but I don't. <laughs> but, but uh, and my, my comment is, uh, <clears throat> golly, they're so easy. It's cigarettes, beer, alcohol, liquor, it's all, it's all legal. And uh, why, why do these lawmakers uh, legalize liquor and cigarette smoking and all that and outlaw marijuana. That's another show, my friend. But I did ask that very question you did, whether or not the studies, I guess, are just for tobacco. But I, I, you know, I'm theorizing that any dirty smoke you suck in your lungs is bad for you. That's common sense, isn't it? Come on, common sense. Do we know if the marijuana smoking is harmful? We don't know yet. For the lungs, right. in, in terms of lung cancer. In terms of lung cancer. We, I don't think that we have enough evidence yet. And like I mentioned earlier, we really practice evidence-based medicine. We had to enroll over 50,000 people in order to determine if screening was appropriate for, for cigarette smokers. I think that um, there will be continuing studies looking at marijuana smoke and the detriment that that may have on the lungs. But as of now, in terms of screening recommendations, we don't have the evidence. Don't know. You gotta just take it from me, man. Whether you're smoking that, maple leaves, grass, whatever. If you're smoking something, it's not good for your lungs. You're a doctor. Don't tell me there's anything good about smoking anything. Well, I certainly would not recommend anyone smoke, no. Yeah, anything. Okay, it's probably not gonna be good for you. Hey, radon. Radon gas, is that mm -hmm. lung cancer connected? Yeah, radon can increase your risk. And there was another set of guidelines that came out that included radon exposure. The problem with radon is it's very, very difficult to measure. Mm -hmm. And you can have people come to your home and, yeah. and measure I the amount of radon. In our sure. home once, yeah. yeah, and it's it's very common. It comes in, out of the rock, and there's mm -hmm. supposed to be some here in Tennessee Absolutely. in certain locations. Absolutely. It's just very difficult to calculate okay. and to be able to quantify the amount of radon exposure someone has had and how that would increase their risk. In addition, okay, we mentioned radon, obviously smoke. Um, I'm just trying to think. Um, other things that you can be exposed to, um, asbestos, those fibers can be cancer-causing. Yes. What about like black mold, things like that, uh, automobile exhaust? 
along those lines. Sure, we see a lot of carcinogens and other things that can cause cancer in the lungs, asbestos as you mentioned, um, from sandblasting, if you don't wear a mask, from working with paints and other things, we can see it's really important to always protect yourself from inhalation of fumes mm -hmm. um, and other materials that you're working with. We do see increased cancers with certain exposures. Uh, could there be increased cancers affiliated in any way with naturally occurring allergies? And what I mean by naturally occurring, pollens and things like that can that, you know i run so i get allergies but i'll still run sometimes and you know, there's a lot of pollen out there in the spring mm -hmm. and it, breathing in tree pollens or flower pollens can that be a problem we can see other abnormalities in the lungs from allergens so there's a lot of people particularly patients with asthma mm -hmm. if you're exposed to certain allergens or different particles it can cause other types of diseases histoplasmosis in the lungs. yeah histoplasmosis is one that we've all been exposed that to you, if we've lived here for a significant amount oh, of you time you think you and i have it i think i probably have several small nodules in my lungs from his And that's like you can be working in the garden or something and yeah. what is it? It's, it's, it's dust bacteria or something? Where does it come from? It's a granulomatous disease. So it, it is in the soil and then it gets aerosolized and we breathe it in and it causes little small nodules and that's one of the reasons people thought screening might not be appropriate in this area of the country because so many people have nodules right. related to histoplasmosis. You, you could look and say, oh that's cancer. It's not. It's right. histoplasmosis. Which right. is not really life threatening, is it? No. Me? Well, it depends. It depends. So some people will react very differently to histoplasmosis. Most people will go on to have very small nodules that will calcify and it won't necessarily cause any abnormalities. People who are immunocompromised, their uh. immune system is depleted for one reason or another. Maybe they're on drugs because they um, have had a transplant or patients who are being treated for cancers if their immune system um, isn't working the way other people's are, mm -hmm. can be more susceptible to having a worse infection from histoplasmosis. Sometimes we see people react to histoplasmosis for various reasons and we're not sure why they're getting huh. so sick. So you can be very and that, ill. And that'll make you cough and have trouble breathing sure. a bit? Does it come from bird droppings? More there are other abnormalities that can come from bird okay, droppings. What, the plasmosis is just in the soil. It's I think mostly like, it's, it's, yeah, aerosolized from the soil. And you and I both probably have it. Yeah. I've gardened. Darn it all. All right. We'll take a break. We'll come back. More of your phone calls. If you'd like to join us, we've got a couple lines open. 737-7587. It is our final segment talking about your chest lung cancer right after this.